Instagram and Twitter, Snapchat, Vanish Today. What else would you have? Boom, clap it. No, just keep bullshitting. Are we rolling? We are always I like rolling. To go. I try not to tell Tasha. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll get nervous. Good, 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 good. I worked for Death Row Records. as an intern. No, I wasn't an intern. I was an A&R there. I worked at Interscope as an intern. That then, okay, so let you want me to tell yeah, the story? Yeah, hold on, yeah. Because yeah. let's go back that. So they say you, it right. Yeah, I'm going to say it right. <laughs> but that's, you know, I got the software with Peter Page. All uh, right, but you're, 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 you're like three stuff. drinks We're going to No. So you worked at Interscope as an intern. Which then turned into a full-time job. And so then that job then turned into a full-time job at Death Row Records, which then turned into a full-time job working for Eminem. What was that like, though, David? I mean, here you are, I mean, just, what, 18, 19? No, I'm, I was 15 when I got the internship. So my, 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 my brother, my dear friend, Evan Bogart, okay, whose dad was Neil Bogart, owner of Casablanca Records, did The Village People, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, uh, Kiss, they were his dad was basically like the Jimmy Iovine of the seventies, early eighties. He and I grew up together, went to Hebrew school together. He and I had a lot in common. His father passed away when he was three years old, just like me. So we went to Hebrew school together. Always had a very tight bond. As we got older and older, about fifteen, Evan had some substance problems and some partying problems, and he was kind of a wild child. Um, he wound up getting a, an internship at Interscope, and. Um, during that time, he was transitioning out of different high schools. He's going to love him telling this fucking story. I love you, Ev, my, my brother. Um, he he wanted to go to rehab. And when he went to rehab, he's like, someone's got to take over my internship. And I, he's like, I'm going to put you in touch with these people. And it's Jimmy Iovine and Lori Earl and the people that ran Interscope. Did you even have like an interest in this? I did because I was like, like my friends around me, like I, I, I saw, I was like, damn, like they, like I saw the fruits of the record business what that was to be that. And um, uh, another thing, Adam Levine was my next door neighbor growing up my whole life. So like Adam was kind of buzzing a little bit and there was a lot of this shit going on. Um, and then Evan was like from this big record company dynasty family and now he had to go to rehab. So he's like, you should take over the internship. So I did. And the internship was the game changer of my life. So at 15 turning to 16, I wound up working there. Like my mom dropped me off first couple times I had to work there, and then I wound up getting my license. I was driving, and uh, I worked in the publicity department, the A and R department, the rap marketing promotion radio department, which is where I met. You know their parent. They were the parent company of Death Row Records. So at the time, you have Tupac, Dr. Dre, the Dog Pound, Nate Dog. Uh, of you know all of the big stars of that era is a major I mean this is like talking about like the Migos or like Drake of that era so this is that's how big way bigger way bigger because we were moving actual units not digital so when you look at digital money versus physical money it was a different game physical game was 17 to 20 dollars a record today it's two to three dollars a record the money is different. The numbers are different. It was a different time. What was that like, though? You know, you met Tupac. I mean, is there... It was unfucking believable Snoop bro. Dogg. It was unbelievable. Are, are was they who un- they perceived them to be? Yes. Or are they different people? They're fucking like- real stars, you know? Tupac was an artist, an impactful human being, a legend. I mean, I remember I met, I met him once. I was in the elevator with him. I was at the office with him. And just to, like, see him in person... To, to, to have the music affect your life in such a broad way and be so connected to the lyrics and the sound and the beat and everything and then to see them you know and I and I and I'll, I'll go back I was new then you know I was real new so I was like it was like crazy to see it I remember being in the elevator with him and I, I pulled in after high school was driving in and Tupac pulled up behind me in an SL 600 convertible and then the dog pound Daz and Corrupt, who I represent now, were behind him in, they were in like a low rider Lincoln coupe on some Dayton's, some 22 inch Dayton's. And we all walked to the elevator together, got in the elevator together and he had the shiny shit, the death row chain. And then we all went in and it was like Tupac's in the, it was just fucking crazy, bro. 
fucking crazy. So we're talking about so this, this Hebrew kid, right, Hebrew little Jew, 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 who's replacing in, some other Jew as, as an intern. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty amazing story. You know, you, how was, you know, I've met Snoop Dogg a few times, and yeah. how was he different from when you met him first to now, modern day? Commercial more? Or well, what? we're just, it's different now because I'm the guy that comes with the checks, and I'm the guy that comes with the opportunities, and I've been known for doing that for a long time, so they look and treat me differently now because we work together, all these guys. Um, back then, I was coming up, and, and part of what it was was... Uh, you know, moving out of like, okay, so, so, so I got into USC business school and I was still working at Interscope and that was like my big thing. And I was like trying to be a part of that. So I went to uh, Jimmy Ivey and I said, listen, I want to continue to work here. Um, can I work while I'm in school? And he's like, no, he's like, you should come back when you're done. And I'm like, no, but I don't want to like lose my opportunity mm -hmm. here. So Suge Knight at the time, this is before Tupac got killed. Um, it's kind of in the midst of like the, the heyday of that crazy summer, 1996, which was a crazy, crazy summer. Um, he was like, I'll give you a job. Okay. You can, I'm going to give you $50,000 a year. Every time, everything that you're not doing in school, you are spending at Death Row Records working for us, doing whatever the fuck we want. So my title that I got blessed with was I was an A&R. So it was cool. I got to work with the artists, but I did everything. I mean, I did everything from driving artists, taking them to the studio, making sure tracks were delivered, picking up cars, going to the bank, do like you fucking name it. I did it. And I was, they called me Super Dave. That was my nickname. I was known as Super Dave, S U P A D A V E. So all my death row clothes always said Super Dave. And Did you ever get a chain? That's so cool. I have a chain. You have yeah. a chain? Yeah, I got the death row chain. Wow. wow. Holy shit. Yeah, so you're this it. Jewish guy from USC it. after working from Interscope to. No, no, I wasn't even. I was at it, SC, so I would go. go I, I comprised most of my days at USC in like three days. And then I would be at death row all the other time. So I don't know. What really is that like, though, David? Come on, let's talk about this. It was fucking I, crazy. It's really new to me, but what is that like? I mean, Imagine if I worked for Drake right now and I was like Drake's right hand man. That was what it would be like. What if I was like, I'm fucking offset and the Migos, I got to go do everything. That's what it was. And I'm walking in with the chain and I'm walking in with three phones and I'm fucking 18 years old and I have a That's fucking, crazy. I got the brand new Lexus GS400 on 22s. <laughs> I got the M4. No I got all these with cars. You you, the power behind you? No, because it was some real gangster shit going on too. But I wasn't a gangster. I wasn't a gangster, but I was around it and I'm a white kid. So imagine me walking down the USC fucking collegiate school to my class and I'm wearing the chain. High as fuck on that chronic, having a good time. Doing accounting, <laughs> doing finance, you see making those moves. Dropping right now, yeah. it's just like, wait, how? Like you are the basically the the Jerry Heller, right? Would you say? You know. Um, I know. Yeah, I wouldn't call myself Jerry Heller. I'm I'm David Weintraub, but I'm you know we all went to that school of of that, and you know I was just a I, I they trusted me, they trusted me. Should trusted me with his checks, with his money. With delivering like what had to be done, I would go to the warehouse by myself. I mean, I don't. I, I'm sure Jacob doesn't even know about that warehouse. There was a warehouse where Shook had all his toys, 50, 100 cars, refrigerators, wow. refrigerators, cold refrigerators, like 20 stacked together, all crystal. Imagine if this whole wall was refrigerators, glass refrigerators, filled with cold crystal, and you're doing nine years. You're doing nine years, but you want to keep the champagne cold. I don't even that know what you say crazy. to that. It, it, that it was crazy. nuts. This is nuts. This is, and that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand is the amount of money that they made at that time. It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Like hundred, like beyond. I'm talking four or five hundred million dollars that was being made because this music was that big. Right. The plaques I have in my house, you go look at them. They're not for selling a million units. Like I saw Meek Mill... Love Meek Mill, it's great. His record went gold, all good. Plaques on my walls from Death Row are for 27 million records and sales. It's That's not that, for those fucking. Are albums too. Those That's are physical too. albums. Right. So physical wow. CDs, tapes, cassettes. Were you part records. of the were you part of the All Eyes on Me? Uh I was working at Interscope when All Eyes on Me was made, and then after Pac died, I was working I worked Ma I worked the Machiavelli record, which was the mm -hmm. record after that. The when he died, what was it like? Well, it was on my birthday, September 7th, uh, 1996. 
and I was working for them and it was very it was surreal it was not real it was uh, it was sad it was horrible is a martyr of your generation it gives me chills saying that and thinking about that right now because that's not just a regular artist that's something that like when I put it on in my car and I'm in my zone and I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm going back and thinking about my life and all the moves I've done that will bring a tear to my eye because I have so many memories of impact in my life listening to that music being a part of it seeing it holding i used to have to take the the you see records used to be made on reel to reels these big like heavy 10 pound two inch tapes i had those reels i held them i could have sold them i could have did anything i wanted them i was responsible for a lot of that shit like uh so i i mean to, to see it like that it was different and to see the fallout the fallout was the biggest learning lesson because uh the empire crumbled the boat sank the car crashed. The plane hit the mountain. It, it, it was fucked up. And they were trying to salvage it. Um, and then it's interesting because my friend Evan Bogart, who if you Google Evan Bogart now, you'll see he's one of the biggest songwriters in the world. He wrote Halo for Beyonce. Um, he wrote Rihanna SOS. He's a huge songwriter. Um, he went to a thing. In, I was working. He was working at Interscope. I was working at Death Row. Because he came back after rehab, he cleaned up, and now I'm at death row, and we were still doing our thing. He was sober. He calls me, he's like, Dave, I need to come see you. And Evan is this bigger than life character, and he's like, okay, I'm like, come see me. Like, well, what's up? He's like, well, dude, I went to the, uh, I went to the Rap Olympics. I'm like, what the fuck is a Rap Olympics? He's like, it was in at the, at the, uh, where the fucking Kings used to play downtown. What was that place called? No, it's not the, the, the sports right? arena, something like that. And it was a hip hop uh, competition battle show that like true hip hop heads went to and that's where Eminem came for the first time and performed and Evan was now this A&R at Interscope coming up his dad was this huge record company owner he met Eminem he met Mark and Jeff Bass who Eminem was signed to Web Entertainment and got the record brought it in gave it to Jimmy Jimmy gave it to Dre and then he called me and he was like I need to get some weed for these guys and I was like <laughs> He's like, I need because Evan's not smoking weed no more because he's back from rehab. He's like, I don't know how to get no weed. What am I going to do? I'm like, okay, we'll get them some weed. And it's all good. So I'm working at Death Row. So he then takes me and we drive to Burbank with like an ounce of weed for Eminem and his crew. And uh, the that's white how boy, I'm, Jewish that's, guy that's, from Death Row Records. That's how we met them. Supplying weed. This that's is too how we funny, met them. David. I'm cracking yeah. up right now. Yeah. And, then, and then a year later, I left Death Row and I started working exclusively for Eminem and Web Entertainment and worked on the first album with them. And wow. then, uh, And then the following year, you know, my best friend at the time was Randy Spelling and the Spelling. So Aaron gave us a million dollars to start our own record label. So we did that. And then we lost all the money and just didn't know what we were doing. And then I went to William Morris, did two years there, then did six years at UTA and then while I was at UTA signed everybody created the TV shows left and I partnered with Troy Carter who's the CEO of Spotify now Lady Gaga's manager owns 10% of Uber He's and, with, and he also managed John uh, John Mayer right he may manage him now yeah. I don't know who else. he managed a lot my favorite of people. artist come on yeah there you go why the move to start your own shop well because at a certain point like um when I left UTA and I did the company with Troy, Troy was in a different place. So I was Eve's and Nelly's uh, agent and Troy managed Eve and Nelly and they were both monster businesses. So he's like was putting together this team to have this big powerhouse management company, brought me in as a co-owner and a manager, but it was pre-Gaga and pre-Uber. So it was in a time where the flux of the business was changing. This is, uh, you know, MySpace is happening. There's no Facebook yet. So like the world was still evolving. It wasn't the greatest position of players that all had the same goals at that time. And the business was changing. Everybody's cool, but the company wound up not working out after two years. And it was like, what am I going to do? I now have hit TV shows on the air. I just did my own company and that was it. And then, you know, there we go. And then what was it, like your biggest takeaway from that? Because a lot of your story is like successes and successes. Yeah. And this is kind of like you know, a downfall, but like, what was, what did you I won't really say it was a downfall because we still made a lot of money, but we, we just didn't like our company did not become real stingray. It did not become the firm. Everybody was doing different things. Fl Troy was floating a boat that was sinking and the business was changing and he had a huge overhead because he put together the company. So for me to be making 300, $400,000 a year as a salary and then taking my commissions and then trying to float a company to make it profitable, right. it just wasn't the right business model. You know, but hence 
three, four years later, Uber happens, Gaga happens. You know, Gaga was on the label, uh, was was part of the company, but she was just this Italian chick named Stephanie who was really weird. And that was who that was. We were like, Steph, Steph's in the studio, Steph's, and it's like, okay, cool. You know, he was still trying to like maintain his stars, Eve, Nelly, Fat Joe, those guys, he was trying to maintain those businesses. You're not thinking about the next, but then the next comes through and it's bigger than everybody. Do you ever feel yourself, you know, kind of segueing out of it, the entertainment and doing something different? Always. Um, but I'm always going to do this, but I'm always going to also look at other opportunities. Like this is not what, this is not the main day to day of everything. This is a piece of my business and a piece of what I do, but it's not everything that I do. I do a lot of other shit. If you could like look back and tell yourself one thing before you started, you know, venturing off into this industry, what would you tell yourself? Um... I would have probably said like focused a little bit more on like the IT tech world early because there were some opportunities that we didn't pay super, super attention to that then panned out. And like I had some opportunities to invest in some really good stuff that I didn't. Right. But so it's I hard just, to predict that. You never know you're with right. that. You're right. You're like, right. You're right. Especially. We, we had a here. guy yesterday come in and he created the fire app before fire took off and did the whole festival which mm -hmm. was so oh my gosh that's the craziest story. it was actually very cool i was looking at it yesterday it had all the right features uh, had all the right ratings yeah. the functionality because i'm kind of a tech guy uh it worked that app good. will never work that concept will never work because there's no way for you to get us out of the business and that's the agents and the managers and everything mm -hmm. you can't press a button and expect the migos to show up too much goes into it right. too much has to happen you cannot trust the wires. People have to be vetted. It's not for the average everyday person. They can't just do it. Right. It's not. It's impossible. Sure. So good luck. It will never fucking happen. Guaranteed. I'm saying that right here. Mark my words. Everybody tries to do that. Like with tech evolving, they're you trying to get as many it. people out of it. But there's agents are agents for a reason. You know, we bring two pieces together. And I just feel like that's something that computers there's or technology There's too many can. things. I get it with something simple like bringing a pizza here or fucking right. getting a ride. Like, yeah, that, is, that ain't hard to fuck up. But like doing a fucking show and doing what we do to execute, it, it's not going to happen on yeah. an app. It's impossible. Months and years go into doing stuff. I have That's dates for sure. booked for next year right now that are that I'm dealing with shit for next year. How the fuck would you be able to be like, oh, I want you to come to my birthday party and you're just going to show up. Here's 20000 It's not going to happen. Yeah. What was the biggest payday that you've ever received from booking an artist? Just like what... What have you achieved? Like what dollar amount? You're saying, wow, that's a lot of fucking money. Uh, you know, big, big five, six figure deals. You know, big five, six figure commissions on one day of work. So after the venture with Troy, what made you decide to start your own company instead of going back to a company that you were already familiar with? Uh, basically, I had offers to go back into the agency world. Obviously not from UTA because like UTA was very upset with me that I did what I did and left in such a controversial way and took my clients and was like, have my own TV show. So it was like pretty fucking crazy. Uh, but <laughs> CAA, Paradigm, ICM, uh, Abrams Artists, um, you know, Gersh, there was all opportunities there. I had a couple of solid job offers from them, but it wasn't really worth it. I didn't want to go back and be a salary guy because my commissions were bigger than the salaries at that point. I didn't have to share anything. And the thing about the agency business is the agency business is like you work for an agency, you get a salary, you get the perks, you get the benefits, you get all that shit, but then you have to fight with them at the end of the year over based on your commissions. And I don't want to wait a year for my commissions. So why would I want to do it? And also as an agent, you can't really produce. And most of my stuff had become about producing and creating. So that was the main struggle point in my mind of why I never want to do it. Would I ever go back? I would have been like a partner board member by now because this would have been 10, 12 years. And I have friends that I've grown up with that are now at those levels. Uh, I pretty much kind of can guarantee though I'm doing better than them. Right. And I see them and we're all friends, but they don't have the shit I have and they don't move the way I move and have the relationships I have. And it's cool. And you can be like the face of an agency and be the department head or be the department partner and all that shit. But like shit, I, 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 I'll wake up to hear what wires came in. I, I, I wake up to figure out what the next fucking order is. I don't want to go. I don't want to go sit through meetings to hear about 50 clients I don't represent. I don't give a fuck about. I want to give a fuck about my business and my people yeah. and what I'm doing. And then I want to go hang out and drive my cars and hang out with my baby and do shit. An agent is a uh, uh, someone who uh, goes out and procures work. They procure opportunities and, and they 
from the procurement of the work, if the deal closes, they take a percentage and the percentage is limited to 10%. Okay, as a manager, you can do the procurement of the work, you can make the deals, you can be the partner, you can be the co-owner, and you can take any whatever number you want based on whatever you and the client agree to. And you can have your ownership stake and do whatever you want. So it's kind of the same business, but a manager is the partner with the talent, with the product, with the company, and the agent is kind of like the workhorse that has to do it. I think a lot of agents, not real estate agents, wait for incoming phone calls and they take incoming phone calls and act as if they did it. I did it. I know that. I mean, I've surely represented that something that I, I made happen, but it was a fucking incoming phone call. So there's the bullshit of that. You cannot agent the agent. You cannot ever agent an agent or an expert. It's not going to happen. I've done it time and time again. I do. I, you know what I mean? Like we learn the game. We invented this game. So there's a lot of that shit that like, that's why I am the way I am because I've already heard the pitch. I've already heard the story. I've already seen the idea. I've already heard the concept and you're not going to sell it. So if you come in and wow me with it or you brought the right person and the sun, the moon, the stars and everything else aligned, then maybe it's worth doing. And those are the things you have to evaluate. What makes you more excited? Is it the talent? Is it the project? What? I used to be excited about ideas because everything was heavily like concept driven. And it was like, what is the concept? What is the idea? What is the execution? And I don't look at it that way now. Now it's more personality driven. And then we create a concept around the personality. So the game has changed a little bit. Um, but you're still looking for the star, obviously. The star or a star that can be made or a star in the making or a star that's on the come up or, you know, a lot of those things. But there's not a lot out there. There's few and far between. Now we just have an abundance of bullshit that we have to watch and like find that fucking needle in a haystack and go and do it. You've like been through like before you said all, of, you know, the records were physical. Now it's digital. Like you've been through like two different, I'm sure like, like two different times of your industry. So like, how, how did you transition from like, you know, going from the records and the old school kind of to the new school and you're still successful in both? Two and a half decades is what yeah. you've been through, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of changes. Just that evaluating been. the market and staying cool, staying true to the trends and following it and, you know, finding talent. Like I, this is an industry that was never gonna go away. They're like, reality's over, rap's over. This, it ain't fucking over. What do you mean? It's evolving every day. You know, and I have stars. I have bona fide people that I have created and and created hit shows and been a part of hit shows. I mean, you know, one thing that we're not even talking about, like I'm the first person that actually took a, an influencer and turned them into a hit television star off of YouTube. And I did that with Hollywood Hillbillies. I proved that that can be done. I can take someone who is a YouTube star and make them a television star. We did 40 episodes of that show. So you executive produced it, created it, and I didn't create it. I executive produced it, and I starred in it. So, and what's the difference between creating? Because you took creating is coming up with the actual concept of the show. I was brought into the show once they sort of figured out what they wanted to do, and I was the executor that could be the on camera face and be the producer of the content. So, so what do you think about the way that? everything the way the trend is going now to being you know social media big like so uh, snapchat instagram uh fuck, sorry snapchat instagram netflix they have their own originals like everything is so digital it's all on an app like what do you think about well they're, that? they're they're useful for a couple different things i mean social media platform is a great marketing tool and it's free and it's you know surpassing what old school grassroots uh you know campaigns have done to promote and market products um now there are more buyers out there so there are a lot more places to take your projects you have your conventional big networks you have your cable networks and now you have premium networks and you have digital networks and you have streaming services so you have all different ways that you can fucking put your content out um, the dynamics of each of them are different like snapchat's trying to become a network but snapchat wants you to pay for your own show i don't want to go bring you my idea for me to pay for it and then you pay me back once it's a hit the fuck is that business model what the fuck are you talking about i'll do my own show on instagram then it doesn't make sense so like there's some business models out there that work and don't work the biggest thing in the game period is facebook and netflix there's nothing bigger so if you're on Facebook or you're on Netflix, you're in the game. You could be on NBC, you have a great show, they talk about you, but you have the biggest audience on those two places. Mm. Do you think that it's easier now to like become relevant like to the public because there's so many like Yeah, but media. you can become relevant, you can become famous, you can become known, but are you gonna monetize it? 
I don't know. Some people do. Some people don't. A lot of people talk about like what they're doing. They got 20 million fucking followers and all this shit. They're living in a fucking studio apartment driving an old ass car. I don't know. I mean, I see a lot of that shit. So what does it mean to be like famous in today's age? Like back then, everybody who was famous, they have longevity in their career. There's still somebody today. We all know who Tupac is. We all know who the Kardashians are. Everything, they last, you know, it's real fame. And today mm. you have those little like 10 seconds of fame kind of things. Like people on social media, they're cool for the relevant for a month or whatever. Catch me outside, girl. All that kind of stuff. I feel like it just kind of has changed what fame means. So like, what do you think? Is well, fame is, fame is, uh, Easier to attain, but harder to maintain. So you may be relevant for two seconds and think because you have a couple articles written about you that you're doing something. But unless you're monetizing it, unless it's happening over a long-term basis and it's actual generating something, it's nothing. You know what I mean? It's like there was a time period where like being on a TV show, any TV show, you're famous. Paparazzi knows you. Mm -hmm. You have people want your autograph. Now everybody's on a fucking TV show. Hey, I went out with you one time. And there was photographers taking pictures of you, I remember. Yeah. Right? Just yeah. right. What, were, what restaurant were we at? I don't know. It was one of those restaurants, but they were taking so many snapshots of you, and I'm like, shit, David? Oh, shit, you're a celebrity? Well, I mean, I mean, right. show, well how, I mean I've been on how many fucking hours of television have I done? I don't, tr- I'm not trying to be the star, but. You're the producer and the star. Like, yes. Well, I'm in the billboard. I mean, I'm in the I'm in the magazine. I'm there. I'm in the article. No, but that's so, pretty impressive. You know? you think but I'm that. I'm more. They know I'm more the business guy, so I don't have like the I don't have the fan the fanny fan. So the five year plan, David. Where are we at? Because you've done you know all the artists uh, producing. What do you think that is next? Well, place? in five years, I'm gonna still maintain my management company and my entertainment business, but I'm gonna be diversified in more products, more endorsements, more real estate, more car stuff, more appearance business you know whatever it may be it's going to be one and the same you know every day every everything is different the phone calls come in the phone calls are made out uh i'm working on some stuff in the food business right now so i have uh you know different things but uh in five years i just want to be you know uh, happy healthy with my daughter with my family you know and just be a good person that's really where i want to be okay last question yeah in a bar you're watching your your lamborghini out there uh, for a tie. Alright, we're done. It's a wrap. I'm out.